What is up, Generals? We're back with Ultimate General Civil War, and this is the JNP Rebalance Mod CSA playthrough. We're uh, taking the skirmish at Cedar Mountain. It's not really a skirmish. I mean, this is enough people to justify the term battle. Um, and uh, there was some great commentary on the Discord, uh, you know, that... Maybe I might have misused or underutilized my cavalry um, in Malvern Hill. And to be completely honest, I actually couldn't agree more. Um, Malvern Hill was an opportunity with that huge, wide-open battlefield for me to um, really lean into the mobility of the faction, or of the cavalry units, and I think maybe I didn't. Especially one of them, I uh, ended up using it predominantly as uh, detached skirmishers, essentially. Um so uh, I went into this and went into Cedar Mountain kind of with the objective of um, two things. The first thing is that Johnston here is fairly close to his second star. Um, so I wanted to see if I couldn't grab that before uh, second bull run. So we, we bring the second core. And the other thing that I wanted to do on the same token is... Uh, generally increase the skill level of second core uh so that it could it could contribute more meaningfully to some of these battles i'm not leaning so heavily on i core um broadly we accomplish that objective but let's talk about what i'm what i'm doing here so i've got a really strong left hook uh and then there's going to be a portion of my force that's dedicated to um holding in the middle and um, I'm still not really sure that this is the right way to approach this battle. I, I, I will admit that there's probably a better way to go about some of these things um, than I than I do it here. Because um, I remember kind of not being crazy about the outcome um, when I was playing it. But uh, the force that's dedicated to holding the river, those are all of my units armed with 1841 uh, Mississippis. And then all my units that are armed with better rifles, which is going to be 1861, Lorenzas, Enfields, you know, those kind of things, Harper's Ferries. Um, those are all going into the Cops of the Woods. There's also two Meatball Brigades um, uh, sort of leading the charge, so to speak. We've got third, we've got the two Dragoon units, uh, one of whom is now acting as a... Uh, as a Lancer unit, as I, I used the rep rewards and picked up the 500 Lamats uh, that you have access to. They're excellent melee weapons. Um, yeah, so uh, we've also got the 5th Alabama Irregulars. They are armed with, um, I believe, Enfields. And they're perked uh, for, I want to say it's just called Light Infantry, I'm pretty sure. And it's the one where they, they get a little bit of an accuracy boost, but not as much as the Rifleman training. And then they take a little bit less morale damage from fires. And they make um, excellent, I mean, they make excellent light infantrymen, basically. Um, so I've, I've activated skirmishers, and I think my general experience with them is that they're useful for screening, and that's pretty much about it. Uh, or coverage, or, or, you know, that kind of spotting things. But... In terms of actual combat utilization, the answer is they don't they don't really bring that much to the table, which isn't honestly a gigantic surprise, and it wasn't really my intention to to be utilizing skirmishers as a battle troop. That has never really been their intent. Um, the artillery package, uh, and I, I, like I have to explain all this stuff because we barely ever use second corps except for the big battles. Um, the artillery package is. Uh, Basically, every gun that I could get via rep rewards or from um, just existing in the armory already. Uh, so it's one unit of four 20-pound parrots. I believe this is the first time we've, we've managed to field 20-pound parrots. It's one James unit and one Blake unit. And I think the, the James and the Blake unit are both uh, seven or eight guns, and the, the parrot unit's four guns. Uh, and then there's a, a Napoleon unit here. So this is my second time running the battle. Uh, there had been, the Napoleon unit used to be a uh, three-inch ordnance unit, and um, as much as I was bitching in Malvern about uh, you know, how I don't see the point of using um, infantry support guns uh, because the AI would just kill them, um, in the case of a unit that is like a Napoleon, where I've just got 
shitloads of them. I think those batteries still play a role, a uh, vital one, probably, in the army. Um, so you see what kind of got going on over here. We have the two Meatball Brigades eating a lot of fire. We've got 1st Virginia on loan from i -Corps. Um, kind of just destroying these skirmishers. And then I'm sort of developing my position in the center. Uh, I am shamelessly borrowing Harbob, um, his his utilization of skirmishers uh, to reduce your incoming casualties some. And, uh, um, you know, it really does a good job of working. And I, I had uh, tried this, I mentioned, with the 3-inch ordnance guns and only one unit holding down here in the south. And it was two... It was way too touch and go, way too dicey. So in the initial attempt at this battle, I had a much heavier left hook on the far northern edge of the map, um, and and I missed it. I missed that weight of my force in this uh, attempt of the battle, but the AI was free to be much more aggressive in a one-unit holding the line kind of action. So we've got two cores units here generally kind of advancing. Um, and uh, I think if I had this to go back and do over again, uh, I, much as I, I said that I wanted to go into this battle with the idea of using Cav, I think if I had this battle to go over and, and do over again, I don't have this thing. I make a point of kind of only having one save. Um, so I can't like save scum and keep going back over and over again. If I had this to go back and do over again, I think, as much as I'm saying I want to do the cab, probably would have brought um, a, a unit of dedicated snipers and one more brigade of infantry and had them hug the um, right edge of the map uh, and then done everything else more or less exactly the same. Um, come here and develop this left hook, do a little bit of work to hold in the center, um, accept and acknowledge there's going to be a lot of back and forth, touch and go, you know, time in that middle there uh, while we're sort of wearing down the Union. And then the reason that I would have had the skirmishers and the uh, a brigade of infantry is um, when I develop this attack like this. So we're for the most part trading pretty e pretty efficiently. We're I, the, uh, we're taking casualties. Like, I'm not going to pretend like we're not taking losses. But by and large, we're, we're generally trading very effectively because they're in the open, we're in cover. Um, <clears throat> we're defanging their artillery, uh, and I'm denying them easy access to, to cover, to fighting from cover now. Uh, with the exception of this one unit, um, I can't read the name of on the tower. So he's in cover, right? But he's pretty heavily outflanked. So the thought process is that eventually he'll give up his position. And then um, the hope is to draw them into uh, attacks on my force across the river. I want them to fight me. I want them to try and come at me, fight me in the river, fight me on my side of the river, uh, you know, fight me in the open, all these kind of things. I want them taking really bad trades uh, and we're getting it a little bit with that with one of those units but we're not getting it with <clears throat> we're not getting it with all of them um, so we're really working on just degrading their position um, on the Union right where it's sort of being fully developed now by uh, Confederate infantry and First Virginia and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're trying to defang their artillery. We're trying to, you know, get get pot shots and volleys in here. We really want to get that supply wagon. I don't think we get it right now. We do, I think, eventually get it, but not not right now. Um, and every time they do this stuff, because they they keep on like bunching their entire command up by the by the flag. I. Uh, I imagine there's probably a way that I play this battle that encourages them to spread out some versus sort of clump, clumping up in the middle there. Um, the clump probably works in my advantage, but it, it also takes longer <laughs> excuse me, longer to do all of this than I imagine it probably should, um, especially because they're in those really dense woods, and those dense woods provide excellent, excellent cover. 
I have to imagine um, that some of these firefights go on longer than they should. Um, maybe I do get the maybe I do get the supply wagon here. Um, so this is the next part of the left hook, and it's it's this is as usual my hammer and anvil battle drill one alpha thing kind of wrote large. It's what I always do with these kind of fights: is you know fix them in one direction and wrap them from the next. Well, the issue is, with that plan, at least in this battle, is that they have a very clear direction of where to go um, that's safe, uh, especially because there's like this weird divot in the terrain right about where uh, the first Texas Dragoons are. Um, there's this like divot that they can hide some troops. Now, in one version of this battle, they had... Um, hidden. They managed to get that big unit of skirmishers in there, and you'll see they think they're going to do it again, unless I unless I get lucky and charge. Um, but you can already see 7th Field Artillery, which is my my, my Napoleon unit, is taking fire. Um, fortunately, I have pretty much wrapped uh, their command at this point. So, the, the objective... Let me, let, me, let me take a step back. The objective of this left hook plan is to completely wrap um, their command here in the middle and just hit it from every side. The problem that develops with this strategy is that um, they have a very safe, smart place to retreat or route that is okay for them. It's okay for them to go in that direction. And that's all those trees to the right of the flag. Now, there's no flag there, there's no real military incentive in terms of an objective for them to go there, but it's it's safe terrain for them to retreat to, and then what that also turns into is in, if, if they fall back into that direction, they will have a chance to ra recover their morale, rally themselves, and then of get back in there uh i do something stupid here i charge with third dragoon without two for wanting them so pretty much in melee you always want to double up on whatever you're charging and uh i don't know what i was thinking i think i probably forgot that i told them to charge. probably what happened is i told i forgot that i told them to charge and then fortunately the power of uh Supporting fires, I think, is what really does this. From uh, First Virginia and Twenty First Kentucky, uh, along with the fact that Lamat, Lamat armed melee cavalry are in fact quite beastly, um, manages to give me a, a, a route. Thank goodness, um, because yeah, I mean, there was over two thousand of them there. They could have really taken a chunk out of. Uh, the first dragoons, and then we managed to kind of keep our casualties there to a minimum. Um, so now I get into this position where, like, I don't know how to develop the offensive here, uh, and that's, as you may imagine, not ideal. Uh, we bring the Napoleons up so that they're just barely in. It looks like uh, shrapnel range versus canister, unfortunately. We pull our northern attack force up way to the north of the map uh, because we want to get them, you know, to the point where the, the cannons shoot at something else. I've got my meatball brigades. Uh, I'm, under, I'm underutilizing the meatball brigades here uh, because I've got them stacked up, like one behind the other. Um, and I should be developing that whole flank, and I'm just not. Uh, so... This is a very interesting battle. Um, you know, in a lot of these fights, you can spend some time reconnoitering the foe, and then once you figure out your angle of attack, you're set, pretty much. And it's not the case here. There's, there's, there's a couple of different really good ways to approach, um, but you have... Sort of the same problem um, as you do at, I want to say it's Cross Keys? I forget the name, but it's the one where you're the Confederates and you're defending the river crossing against a Union attack. Um, 
and uh, there's like two flags, and you have a hard time getting at it. It's like the last episode that I couldn't beat on Legendary that made me downgrade. I think it's cross keys, pretty sure. Um, it's one of those situations where the game does a really great job, even in the rebal, where they give you more slots. Um, where you just don't have enough resources to do what you want to do here. And I'm trying and failing uh, to like convince the enemy that they've been enveloped and that they need to fall back. Um, I'm just not doing a great job of it, too. And I'm eating, eating needless rifle fire on First Virginia. I'm fighting dudes hiding in the woods. It's, it's not a good time. Like, I'm not playing this great. And it's one of those things, like, I think if I had one more brigade of infantry, um, I don't know. I, like, now that I'm watching this, I'm getting mad at myself for playing it like a dummy. Uh, I think watching this now, what I do is I play the opener exactly like I did. Uh, and then you know how I've got that task force of three brigades up north? Instead of whining about not having enough infantry, because I think the two cav is still useful in this battle, I have them hug the north of the map, and I have them move right. And then the meatball brigades and my guys across the river and whatnot, they all attack like they're doing right now. And then the idea is that this force that's consisted of 21st Kentucky, 15th, uh, sorry, 16th Tennessee, and 1st Virginia, they attack from the top right corner of the map. And so that the units here... The only direction they have where they're not being fired at is straight back into the open. Oh, man. Yeah, now that I'm watching this, I'm thinking, like, that's a much better way to do this. So, yeah, if I'm coming from the top right of the screen, I've got 24th Louisiana, uh, 20th Virginia, 19th Virginia. Um, these all units are all down here, and then I've got 15th South Carolina and stuff, and the two meatball brigades all attacking from the south and the west of their position. If I have a task force of three brigades coming from the um, the northwest, no, northeast, uh, I think that the AI will likely retreat in the only direction that it can, and the only direction it can is just straight north into all this open terrain. Ah, much better. Yeah, so do what I say, not what I do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because uh, then they'll retreat north into this open terrain, you can push across the river really quick with all these guys and then basically occupy if, if that works, basically occupy their position but then they're in the open and you're in cover and then you move, you move your artillery up quickly and everything else. Yeah, that'd be much, much better. This still works. I still got out of this battle for very light casualties. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of them are on First Virginia. Like these units here across the river, they they take a little bit of a pounding, but not much. The Meatball Brigade takes a Meatball Brigades plural both take a pretty heavy pounding. Um, the cavalry takes some losses. Like everyone takes losses, right? But uh, I take way more than I want to on First VA, and I think a big part of that's me being stupid and putting them on the flank like that. Like they should be in the center of my force where they're protected, and they can really just make the the weight of their musket fire bear come to bear. And uh, and they're not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not using them that way. They're they're on the flank and they're exposed to all kinds of fire. And like the hope, the dream was that they would be over there on the flank, crushing the flank, forcing the enemy to sort of um, route route ball or surrender ball into the center. Uh, and that's not in the least what happens here. Um, this is pretty cool on the AI's part. They've got this big big cav brigade Bayard. Um, and I noticed that one of my dudes on the south side of the river was getting flanked, and I couldn't see anybody. So I sent uh, the, uh, the fifth the regulars and what I've got. I don't know. I sent my skirmishers, wherever they are. Um, fifth, yeah. Sent the fifth over there to go investigate, expecting to find either the unit of skirmishers or the unit of cat. I didn't, I didn't know which one it was going to be. So, um, if it was the skirmishers, I would have needed to detach a few more skirmishers and kind of have a swarm to go over after them. Uh, but in woods like this, I'm actually confident enough to just let it be uh, the um, the light infantry alone. Although, 
Uh, sooner or later, I do actually end up sending my cav all the way around my force. Um, all the way around. And then sending them in to attack that uh, cav unit because the, the, the Alabama boys get tired. I'm pretty sure is what happened. They get exhausted. I, I run them ragged trying to run this cav down. And I'm like, look, I need to just wipe out units. Like, my objective here is destroy units wherever possible. Like, I don't know what I'm doing with First Virginia. Like, I, I get it. He's over here like, I can flank. But he's just exposing himself. He's just getting ready to get flanked by somebody else. And I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so, let's take a step out of the game. Um, I played this battle earlier this week. Uh, and I had a, a midterm. Midterms, I'm coming out, the, I'm coming out the other end of midterms. Just uh, gotten slammed at work. Delivered some projects, um, some analysis projects. And I, I don't think that my head was completely in the game. That's that's kind of what I'm working towards. My theory here is I, as I usually play this, this is my game to wind down. Um, it's partially why I didn't like Legendary is well and I'm sure I'm sure if I played legendary with a different start I probably would have a good time um, because I think I was just boxing myself into a corner like a dummy but that's beside the point so I, I, I wind down with this game I really have a fun time playing. Uh, I bitch about you know counter battery fire and I, I whine about things like ghost cavalry bugs and stuff like that but it is it is generally a really fun game. I have a blast. So I came back and I'm just mauled by this finance midterm. Um, I uh, have talked about a couple times what I do you know in my real life is, is I'm a I'm an uh, IT consultant and an analyst and I do a lot of statistical analyses but I have tools, software tools to do them. And the truth is, is that while I work in, an, in a quantitative field, um, typically those numbers are, it, it's like tools in your toolbox. Um, so you've got to know which statistical analysis to run and then kind of what the output means and how you use those, how you use the output to advise strategy. Like what is what does this output mean in terms of sales or mean in terms of um, what should you do to your product or what should you do to your um, your line of business. How can you make it more efficient? How can you help this? How can you help that? Whatever. Uh, or, or should you go with marketing product A versus marketing product B? What tests better? What, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's, it's very fulfilling work. I rather enjoy it. Um, but uh, the degree I'm going for is very quantitative. And for the most part, all the, the, st the, the class work that I do is the same as my work work. Here's a computer program, Excel or R or Python or SQL. Um, do do something with it, and you have reference material, and you've got uh, yeah, we need to fall back. You've got reference material and everything else. So all that's to say is this finance class. He's like he wants me to do it. Wants us to do it the right way, the old way, uh, which is to say algebra shitloads of algebra and for as quantitative as my job can be I rarely ever actually do het math and it's it's functionally unheard of for me to do any kind of analysis without reference material um so all of that's to say i just come back from spending three hours um close book close note which is fine and it's it's a, it's a viable methodology for the purposes of, of testing Close book, close note. Uh, evaluating and, and, and pricing out bonds and stocks with theoretical yields and um, unknown dividends and trying to figure out, like, what should we pay for this stock? What should we pay for this bond? Da -da 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 -da. All this crap. And then a bunch of definitional crap, and that's just flashcards. Whatever, it's fine. So I'm, I'm mauled. Like, mentally, I'm exhausted. And my brain's just goop at this point in time. And, you know, like, I've got work on top of the rest of this stuff, and I've got, <laughs> like, life to keep up with. So... All of that's to say, I welcome you guys into my existence. Um, I don't think that I was playing at my best. And usually, 
I would have said, okay, let's re-record the episode. Let's take a minute, sleep it off, call up the old save, the, the auto save before the battle or something, and, and go into it. Try it again. I have ideas about how I play this battle differently. The um, issue is that I sat down and I recorded uh, the next day. I had a little bit of downtime at that after work that day. And I recorded uh, the other, the next battle. And I and I, I forget the name of it, but, but basically what happens is you're playing the Confederate side of Distress Call. Um, like the second Union mission after the tutorial. Where, like you're playing the Confederate side of that mission. And one of the things that uh, I actually really liked about it is that you're you're in command of the AI's units. Um, and this mission, the way that it's designed, and I have a suspicion that the game was originally designed this way with this this way, and then they blew it up to brigades for whatever reason. Um, so in that mission, you're playing regiments and cavalry squadrons and artillery batteries. Like, they're all small. The entire battle's small. And um, the Union is also relatively the same size as you. So it's a, it's a very even fight. Uh, and you still have splitting on both sides, and you still have no control over who gets what perk and all that kind of stuff. So you get some weird shit. All that kind of deal. But the units are, are pretty well equipped, generally. Uh, and the units have decent stats. And I don't know if this is Johnny or the base game that does that. I'm pretty sure it's Johnny and Panda. But, you know, you never, you never know. Um, but I played it. And you know, I played that battle out. And Cam was very happy with the outcome there. And mathematically, I can't complain about the outcome here um, too much. Uh, and so I'll talk about that battle when I get to it. But point is is that like I, I watch this now and I'm kind of like you could do better you, you could and you have done better but at the same time you know we're committed uh, so to speak in that I've already recorded the next episode um, and uh, you know it is what it is uh, but we're developing the attack here um, I, I've finally gotten them to leave the woods I'm pretty excited about this we're shifting um, they're coming to attack me and so we're coming we're shifting into a, a stance of Instead of attacking them, we're ready to receive their attack. And I'm getting ready to launch on the offensive. I'm getting ready to send my dudes onto the attack um, and take the flag and everything else. Because this is not a battle where you, you run out of time if you control the flag. Um, so they've come into the open, and now they're coming like obliquely across the river here, which, which what I really think is happening is not that they're attacking me, but because there's two of them on top of each other. Uh... <laughs> I think what's happening is one of them's getting squeezed out. And so we're, we're blasting the ever-living shit out of Crawford. Uh, and um, I really just think I should have had First Virginia in the center somewhere. You know, and I, I don't, or maybe not even brought it. Well, I don't know, because they get a great kill ratio here. I think the, the presence of that two-star unit really does increase the lethality. And having, having a two-star unit to kind of lean on as a crutch... Um, helps the rest of the of the, the attack force here that's honestly this is the entirety of two core like i don't actually have a fourth or a fifth division in two core yet i'm gonna build one for a second bull run um and and the fact that you get to use entirely allied troops going into uh, whatever the next mission is called uh, it gives you a chance to kind of catch your breath so to speak so you don't get any more experience and that sucks because I wanted to I wanted to send uh, two core into the into the meat grinder again, and and get uh, Johnston his second star. So uh, spoiler alert, he's not quite get it here at this battle, um, which is a shame. I mean, it sucks. He's gonna he's gonna get it. I might see if I can't send um, I might see if I can't send Johnston into you know how second bull run kind of has like an initial skirmish. Um, I'm gonna see if I can't send Johnston into that into that attack, or into that battle, uh, and, and if that little bit is enough to give. I, I, I imagine it won't be, um, but we'll see. Anyway, um, so now that I've kind of got them in a place where I feel okay about launching the attack, um, we're we're doing exactly that. The meatballs are still kind of uh, launching themselves. 
uh, into the fray, eating all the fire, so forth and so on, and flanking with rifle-armed troops. Um, and now I'm sending uh, dismounted or dis yeah dismounted skirmish cav and also uh, the Alabama boys to sort of wrap up the Union uh, left flank. Um, and the thought process here is let's push them out of the woods. This is always my this has always been my kind of um, dream battle plan here is is let's take over the enemy's position and then keep them out of it. Basically fight the rest of the battle keeping them out of it. So it's very touch and go here for a bit. Um, I keep looking for an opportunity to get in there with my cavalry and then the melee version. Uh, and the, the worry that I've got right now is that they're so densely pocketed up and there's not really any opportunity to get around anything. This is a fairly densely populated battlefield that um, unfortunately I kind of keep thinking like I'm not going to have a chance to get in there with what I want to get in there with. But we, we keep shredding them with musket fire, uh, so that part works out fine. And, um, yeah, yeah, so the attack goes off really well here, actually. I'm really happy with how the attack comes together. Um, there's a, a lot of misplay on my part in, in terms of accepting losses I don't think I should have accepted. Um, and, I, and I know I'm probably, like, I'm not the, not the guy you watch. Uh, when it comes to Ultimate General, if you want these like super clean playthroughs where you don't take any losses, like I know, I know, <laughs> I take a little higher casualties generally. I think than someone like, like SC and Panda in particular, but increasingly Warbop as well. They they have got really clean playstyles and they take s s like nice low losses. Um, and I and I stand and fight sometimes, and maybe I shouldn't. Uh, and I. I'm stubborn on the defense, I think, sometimes, when I should be a little more flexible. Because um, I'm like, well, I've got good terrain. Screw you. You can get shot. <laughs> so, uh, and that's just kind of the way that I rock it. So, you know, good and bad. I know it definitely has a downside, for sure. Um, but uh, we, we do a good job here. I, I like I like the way that the attack comes in. The Confederates are very tenacious on the attack here. Uh, and the, the, uh, the relatively inexperienced 2-core impresses the heck out of me. Um, in this battle, they do really great, uh, and we uh, successfully managed to get the Union out of the woods um, through predominantly like point blank musket range attacks with um, smoothbore units, actually, uh, and I know I crap on the Springfield Forty Two a lot. Uh, and as a long-range weapon, it's out of trash. As a long-range weapon, you don't want to use it if you can avoid it. But up close, yeah, dude, this thing is great. It's got a good rate of fire. You know, hits hard. It's 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 good as far as all those things are concerned. Um, but we're we're I'm happy with how things are developing at this juncture. I need to be a little more proactive with the supply wagon. Uh, and um. As my artillery package continues to develop itself, uh, I'm going to be a lot more interested in its ability to destroy infantry from range, especially whenever I get my hands on siege guns, which I imagine will not be for a while. I have not seen the AI from the Union perspective um, fielding a lot of, like, really high-end cannon yet, uh, or even really high-end rifles yet. Um, so I'm expecting it'll be a minute before I see siege guns on the a on the Union side, which is just fine by me. <laughs> um, you know, I'm happy to keep that particular armed escalation to a minimum. Uh, and yeah. But broadly, I think this goes really well. Um, I guess let's get into some numbers. So, let me see. Uh, first thing, uh, speaking of meatballs, this is unrelated entirely. Uh, user Adishi on um, on the Discord. I think I may have made a made a, a meme. <laughs> he sent me this great picture, not me specifically. 
you name one of his units a meatball brigade and it, using it presumably like like i use my meatball brigades just right there to eat the fire hilarious i don't know if i was i don't think i was ever expecting someone else to name a unit like i do uh, i think i'd seen someone else refer to one of their units as a grenzer unit as well which is my melee um skirmishers and that's cool as well that that uh, some of my dumb, vaguely historical, although Meatball Brigade is definitely not historical, uh, naming conventions are sticking. It's fun. So thanks to Adishi, uh, as well Ad uh, Adishi and Scott both both commented a little bit about um, more Scott, I think, than and Panda about my cab usage, uh, and they're both right. They're they're all right about. Uh, there's a lot more proactivity that I could be bringing to these battles than I am. Um, vis-a-vis -vis the utilization of cab. And I, I um, uh, because the, the battlefield itself is basically just clean up at this point, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I have a suspicion that my play style took a unnecessary draw towards the conservative side of tactics because I kept getting my shit pushed in by legendary. Um, I beat Shiloh at legendary with the Confederates, so I'm pretty proud of that. But I kept having a really rough time with every single one of these battles. Every time I tried to get cute, the AI would punish me for it. And then every time I um, leaned on the tried and true, which is to say I would bring to these battles like nothing but infantry and as many cannons as I could justify and I would just lean on that lean on weight of numbers and then shattering them with cannon before they actually got to me because I couldn't make anything else work so I have a suspicion that I uh, like got scared maybe where I was confronted with so much like lack of success that I was like, all right, well, if that's the case, we need to just go with what we know works, and that's just dudes and cannons and dudes and cannons, right? And like, oh yeah, poor first VA. Ugh. It bugs me how poorly I've utilized that brigade in this fight. Um, I'm watching myself a couple days later, and I'm just like, ah, oh, jeez, <laughs> you can and have done better. Mm. It's okay. Welcome to life. Um, anyway, so, yeah, I, uh, I got very, like, safe, very risk-averse tactically. The situation right now, where the Union's backed up right now, this is why I was thinking about ways that I would do it differently. This is why I wanted to have units attack from, uh, the north and right of the map, because... They've still got nice, safe terrain to retreat into. And ultimately, I do get troops behind them and push them into the open and then crush them that way. And it works out. It works out. But I'm sure that we take heavier losses than we need to and that this fight goes longer than it should uh, otherwise go um, explicitly because I am fighting them in the woods. Right? And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure of it. So... Uh, lesson learned, I guess. Um, first of all, the lesson learned, uh, Warbob, what I'm, what I'm calling the Warbob maneuver, uh, which is pause the game really quick, detach skirmishers, and then tell both units to hold. I'm going to call that the Warbob maneuver, and it, it works wonders. Uh, it will probably not work wonders whenever Panda and Johnny release the 1.26 version of this mod. And the reason that that is the case is uh, if you guys, anybody here has played the uh, UI AI version of the mod, that version of Skirmishers, I think, is being brought over to the Rebel. It, honestly, like I think it probably has a better, it, it's like it's, it's more at home in the Rebel than it is uh, in the UI AI, which purports to maintain the vanilla balance as much as possible. Um, but it's, it's valid in both places. Like people are using skirms, right? Uh, so the the big change there is that when you detach your skirmishers, there's a cooldown um, to when you can reattach them. I'm fine with that. 
I'm you try and you, you try and break off 210 men from your formation and then be like, ah, just kidding, get back in here. Like <laughs> right? Like you throw that skirmisher screen up, it takes a minute to get them to come back. You gotta blow your horn, they gotta realize what's going on, or you beat your drum or your fife or whatever your particular unit has. Um and they've gotta come back and reform and get back in ranks and everything else. Like it takes a minute. Uh, for everybody to fall in. So, uh, like, that's fine. I don't have an issue with that. It's also gamey as shit um, to detach and then immediately reattach skirmishers and whatnot, and I get it. Legendary's a bitch, right? I would happily use those tricks. <laughs> like, going into Legendary. Like, I think if I ever try and do an, an honest-to-God second attempt at Legendary, I'll do that shit. I'll do all that stuff. Um, because it's Legendary. Yeah, I do. But here, just detaching those skirmishers and, and then having them both hold position and standing and fighting, it really does do a great deal to mitigate somewhat the incoming fires. And it's quite nice in that regard. Um, so the other thing you got to watch out for in, in the future versions of this mod, let's say you're, if you're watching this video in the future uh, and they've released the update, um, I'd be wary of doing some of this stuff uh, in that mod. The reason, reason I say that, one of the proposed changes that Panda's working on, and it's one that I agree with, is um, he wants to preserve the ability for skirmishers to fulfill their actual role, which is to say screening and recon, without allowing them to be um, really viable combatants. So it's okay if you've got them performing flank fires, like you've got Brigade. Let's say I had 17th MS Mississippi engaging someone in the open, and then they detach their skirmishers and move the skirmishers around to the side. That's fine, right? You're doing that. You're doing that for the flank morale multiplier, not so much with the expectation that they're going to function as genuine infantry. And honestly, like in the vanilla game, you can do that in the vanilla game. Like you can break off your skirmishers and then use them to replace infantry. Hell, there's a, there's a, I, I know he's using the rebal, but um, the history guy has a whole playthrough where I don't think he's using detached skirmishers. I think he's just using dedicated skirmishers, but like it, it is apparently not the goal um, of the mod to allow you to utilize what I would call Prussian tactics. Um, Prussians in this era and a little afterwards, because plot twist in the 1860s, there was quite a bit of, of combat going on in Europe as well. They were really pioneering um, a lot of the use of light infantry as the main infantry. Uh, and they were doing a lot of really cool stuff with it. Now, part of that, part and parcel, was, uh, and I'm going to get the name of this thing wrong, it was the needle rifle, or the pin rifle, or something like that. But uh, the idea was, was that it was a super duper, like relative to this period, super duper accurate rifle, basically. And it was a infantry battle rifle. Was, we're not talking about, like, the Whitworth, where I've got maybe a thousand over the course of this entire playthrough. Like this was this was their main line battle rifle, and I think the French had one two in this era as well. Uh, not the you know traditional Carlville um, or Charleville. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. The point. Uh, the goal is not, to my knowledge, for the player to be able to you know be their own uh, Frederick, which I get and I support. That's not. That's not really how infantry was utilized um, in the American Civil War. Uh, so it's it's appropriate then that for the most part the game encourages you to play as would have been the case historically. For the most part, you had formed heavy infantry being 80 plus percent, 90 percent of the manpower of, a, of of both armies. And while there were light units. Um, and skirmishers for sure fought pickets and stuff on each other all the time. The main thrust, especially if we're to believe that this is supposed to be a brigade level effort, would have been formed infantry brigades, working as one uh, big heavy block. Um, 
And that takes me back to, you know, my, my thesis that this game was originally designed with the idea that the base unit, base maneuver unit would be a regiment. Um, and uh, I'm not going to get into, like, the specifics or whatever, but, like, I think that it, it, it's weird to maneuver a brigade like we do on the map here um, and then have have them fight. Like, they didn't really do that. The brigades would break up and fight all the time, like, spread out. Um, not, you know, not dispersed. Generally speaking, they wouldn't intersperse each other, but they would cover a wide swath of terrain. And there's not really a great way to do that here, except for your, evidently, your entire brigade is deployed in double line, um, or depending on the numbers, single line. Um, but all the, a lot of the um, historical battles or the side missions or whatever, they, they give you these names of these units, and it's like 12th New York, 13th Ohio, it strongly indicates to me that the intention initially was, was for these to be regiments. Um, and, uh, in fact, I, I think uh, one of the guys was talking about um, a sub-mod that would try and change the game to do exactly that. Now, on the one hand, that sounds really cool. On the other hand, holy shit. Try and, like, like Panda was saying, like, he would need to triple the unit slots or whatever to try and get that many units in a division, which is about right, historically. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Can you imagine the, the, the micromanagement nightmare that that would be? Woof. On the one hand, I think that sounds really cool. And I would love to see regiments as the base unit. But that would force, um, you know, it would force the AI to have units no longer than a thousand men. And that's we get some cash here which is fantastic uh all right so after medicine i wrote this down after medicine it's uh okay come on play nice here we go uh just over twenty four thousand union and um a, like 4500 plus or minus confederate so that's 4.85 five 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 repeating <laughs> to one um we capture a bunch of 1861s which is excellent um, recover a couple of the weapons that we dropped. We have, it's a pretty good battle. I'm, I'm very happy with it. Um, and unfortunately no one who didn't already have a star gets one, which is a shame. Uh, I still don't have enough. I still haven't suffered enough casualties in one of these units to make them a skirmisher, uh, sniper unit. So I end up deleting one of these guys before the next battle. Um, I delete the fourth Georgia. Um, I put the perk here into, I believe, medicine. Uh, and then at the end of the next battle, I'll put it in... Uh, I'll put it in econ. I, I thought about putting it into AO, but here's the thing about that. I haven't finished filling out second core. I don't know if I really need another slot per division yet as I'm still having a hard time keeping everything that I've got equipped so anyway I put the point into medicine here because I love that um, recovery and then I put it into econ in the next battle because I want to be able to buy cheap guns and cheaper officers so with that being said I will see you guys in the next one I hope you enjoyed uh, the video um, this is a very interesting fight with a lot of opportunity for uh, good reflection with that being said, though, this is Fiasco. I'll see you guys in the next one and looking forward to it. Talk to you then.